The next big change to the church took place during the Persian conquest in 614 AD when the church was pillaged and suffered significant damage. However, it was restored by the monk Modestus. According to tradition, it was during this time that the relic of the true cross was also taken and then recovered in 630 AD. In 648 AD, Jerusalem came under Muslim rule, but Christians were still able to make pilgrimages to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. However, in 1009 AD, the Muslim Caliph Al-Hakim gave orders for all churches to be destroyed. This proved fatal for the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which was singled out in particular and destroyed beyond recognition. During the destructions of the church, the tomb of Christ was largely destroyed. However, some of the rock of the tomb and the location of it were still preserved. The church was again restored at a large expense by the Roman Emperor Constantine IX, Monomachus, and the Patriarch Nisophorus of Constantinople in 1048 AD. Then a little bit later, the Crusaders renovated the church in 1112 and consecrated it in 1149 AD. Much of what is seen today of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is from the Crusader renovations in around 1112 AD. Although portions of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre are from the time of Constantine and can still be seen today in the church. As 12th century maps reveal, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was the spiritual focus of Christianity and its most important pilgrimage center. The church was laid out to enable pilgrims to move from chapel to chapel, their visit culminating in the Holy Sepulchre itself. The church that the Crusaders built included the courtyard where Golgotha was believed to have been and enclosed everything under one roof within a magnificent cathedral. The entrance to the church was changed from the east end and placed on the south side as it is today. The Basilica of Helena, Helena was Constantine's mother, accessed from stairs leading downward was also built. This is the believed place where Helena found the true cross of Christ. It was originally in a hole under the quarry during the early period of Christianity. The entrance to Calvary was from the outside of the church with stairs leading upwards to a platform where all the events of the crucifixion are located. The Basilica of the Martyrium was also changed and everything was now housed under one roof of the church. The apse of the church Constantine built for the crucifixion site faced west. Today it's changed and faces east, but it's the very same spot. The sites of the crucifixion and tomb have remained in the same places since the time of Christ. Only the buildings around them have changed. This is important to realize that the sites, the crucifixion place, and the burial place are the exact same locations. The only thing that has changed are the buildings around them. An edicule was also built over the tomb of Christ and within it is the chapel of the angels and what's left of Christ's tomb. Later, the right-hand side of the door was blocked up after the Muslim conquest of the city in 1187 AD. Now the entrance consists of just one large single door, as you can see here today. The three primary custodians of the church were appointed when the Crusaders ruled Jerusalem. They are the Greek Orthodox, the Armenian Apostolic, and the Roman Catholic churches. In the 19th century, the Coptic Orthodox and the Ethiopian Orthodox and the Syrian Orthodox also acquired responsibilities as well, but in a smaller way. Each church denomination agrees to times and places of worship in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre today. A Muslim family has been given the key for opening and closing the church doors since 1187 when Muslims seized control of Jerusalem and it has continued until this very day. 
Now after a fire, the last major changes to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre took place in around 1808. The edicule over the tomb was renovated. Now the Catholicon was at one time where part of the courtyard of Constantine's church was located. New stairs leading up to Calvary were changed from outside the church to inside. So today, you enter from just inside the church, turn right, and take steep stairs up to the platform of Calvary to see all of the events of Christ's crucifixion. The Edicule, or Tomb of Christ, has been renovated several times since the Crusaders. It suffered an earthquake in 1927 and was shored up, and then recently, in 2016, it underwent another major renovation. As mentioned earlier, there is nothing but the floor and back edge of the tomb that is from the time of Christ. In 2016, the marble slab covering the tomb of Jesus was uncovered and the original rock was exposed. Now because of all the adornments and construction over the centuries, it is hard to imagine how the site would have looked like in the time of Christ. However, these 2,000 years of activity and tradition give greater weight to its authenticity. Some people have an adverse reaction to the atmosphere inside the church. However, this is what we should expect from a place that has been venerated for two millenniums. Now in archaeology, one of the most important factors in locating an authentic site is having one thing built upon another. So you have all this history of one thing built upon another, upon another, upon another. Now the Church of the Holy Sepulchre has around 2,000 years of such history of one thing built upon another. So for me personally, there is no doubt that this is the genuine place where Christ was crucified, buried, and rose from the dead to pay for our sins. All of the evidence and historical writings from eyewitnesses provide overwhelming evidence that points to the authenticity of this site. Now what are some faith lessons that we can learn from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? While we might not agree with the decorations and atmosphere of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, do we appreciate all the devotion and sacrifice that has been made to remember and commemorate all Jesus did for us on the cross? We have to realize there have been countless people who have spent countless hours protecting, caring for, building, and venerating this site. So we have to honor and appreciate all that has been done here to keep this site intact so that we today know where Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. Also, the fact that this place, along with many others, have been preserved and set aside to honor Christ and the events of the Bible provide powerful evidence regarding the historicity of Christ and the truthfulness of the Bible. So the Bible is true. It is here in the Holy Land. It cannot be erased unless we erase Israel off the face of the earth. So do we truly believe the Bible and everything written in it? Now after all that we have learned and seen in this video, and that this is indeed the place where Christ was crucified, buried, and rose again, I would like to meditatively read the Gospel of Matthew's account of what took place here. And as I read this, really understand you are right in the place, you are looking at the very place where the most important event in the history of mankind took place. So Matthew 27, 33 and on says, And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head they put up the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. 
and those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He served others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusts in God, let God rescue him now, if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. However, we know that one of the robbers, one of the thieves, did confess Christ as Lord, and Christ said, Today you will be with me in paradise. Verse 45 says, Now from the sixth hour darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. The sixth hour would be noon until the ninth hour was three in the afternoon. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Christ is saying in this statement, he is paying for the sins of all mankind. They're being laid upon him. He's paying for the eternal punishment of hell that each person deserves. And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran, and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, Let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Many women were there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee while ministering to him. Among them was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now Christ is going to be buried. Verse 57 says, When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. Now on the next day, the day after preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, talking about Jesus, what a horrible thing to say about him. After three days, I am going to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go. Make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. Now we come to the resurrection in Matthew 28. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, this is Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothes as white as snow. 
The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. So in closing, it was here that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. This place is where it all took place and should cause us deep gratitude for what happened here. History has not forgotten what happened. And for this reason, this place has been venerated and preserved over the centuries and millenniums. Christ's existence and work on the cross is an undeniable historical event that proves Christ is who he said he was and is indeed the Savior of the world. If you haven't trusted him as your Lord and Savior, then now is the time to do so. Well, I hope that you have enjoyed this video. I hope that you have found it significant to see all that has transpired here, all of the witnesses, all of the evidence that points to the fact that this is indeed the place where Christ died, was buried, and rose again. Well, thank you for listening and watching, and may God richly bless you.